Okay, so uh, this video is to reveal what the images that you uh, have ranked actually are depicting. So if you haven't yet ranked the images, please do that now on your ranking sheet and then come back to this video and I will explain what you're actually looking at. So here's the first uh, image pair and uh, the sort of theme of these pairs is simply to depict an archaeological site that has been exposed by people. And I'm using the word exposed and not excavated because the site on the left is the al Hiba site in Egypt. And this is actually not an excavation. This is a looter's pit. The site has been looted. Um, you can see they sort of uh, just honed right in in the center here. This is a tomb and they broke through the capping stones and they sort of tore through these reed mats to get at the good stuff, pottery or maybe gold or other kinds of uh, precious, um, fairly valuable kinds of artifacts that could be sold on the black market. And an archaeologist would love to carefully excavate a site like this and would definitely have treated these very old, well-preserved reed mats a lot nicer. Over here on the right, we have the Montpelier site in uh, Virginia. This is a historical site. You can see here there's sort of the outline of a house and maybe the cellar pit. Uh, not a lot of gold and jewels probably at this site, um, but you can see here archaeologists are excavating the site scientifically and carefully laid out in a grid and they're collecting all the artifacts and they're going very, very slow and recording exactly what they're doing. So this is a scientific archaeological dig and this is a looter pit. Um, the motivations are completely different here. On the right, we want to learn about the past. On the left, these folks wanted to get some stuff that they could sell because in this part of the world, uh, artifacts from the past are actually quite valuable. Okay, case two are two online galleries for uh, archaeological artifacts. In this case, both of them are depicting Chinese bronzes. The top, you can see this is the Asian Art Museum online collection. And here's the depiction, an image of the artifact, and a description, a ritual wine vessel called a lei from China about 550 to 450 BC from the Eastern Zhou period. And there's some other information about it, dimensions, that kind of stuff. On the bottom is Sotheby's Auction House. And here we have some uh, bronzes, actually a little bit older than this particular one, but also from China. And the only information other than the general time period is that it was sold for more than a million dollars. And these are going to go into the collections of private collectors and will probably not be viewed by very many people at all. These ones are on display or at least are in collections and can be viewed by museum visitors and researchers. Now, on the surface, this definitely seems more scientific. There's more information. It's more publicly available. Yet probably both of these artifacts were obtained in the same kind of way. They were probably looted or excavated very unscrupulously and are now uh, in this sort of gray zone where they're available uh, either on the auction market or they were donated to a museum from a private collection. And both of them have most of the context missing. There's probably no information of where these were found, what site, what layer, what part of the site, or anything like that. And so they're sort of standalone artifacts that can be understood, but, uh, you know, the context is missing. These ones are going to go into private collections, and so they won't be publicly available. These ones are at least in a museum where they can be studied and viewed and appreciated by the public. Case three, here we have uh, uh, two images depicting archaeological sites with some kind of destructive activity happening. On the top here, we have road construction salvage dig. In this particular case, these are actually archaeologists, or in this case, a backhoe operator probably hired and working under the supervision of archaeologists. And in this case, a road is going to be built here, and the archaeologists have been called in to do a salvage excavation, which means they're up against the clock. They have a limited amount of time to figure out what's going on, to save what can be saved before the road is going to come through. And so they called out what we'll call the big guns, the, the big machines, to quickly get down to uh, artifact bearing layers or to cut a trench across the site to quickly see what might be there. And yeah, this is a crude method that ideally we wouldn't use, but in this circumstance, it's the method that makes the most amount of sense. So it's going to be destructive, 
but it's gonna at least let us figure out what's going on there before they completely destroy the site when they build the road. Down here, what we're seeing is the archeological site of Palmyra in Syria. It's Hellenistic or Greek period, uh, also Roman period. And what we see here is uh, actually full-scale demolition by explosives of parts of the temples at the site by ISIS or ISIL, or sometimes called Daesh. Um, the, the group that for many years recently has sort of been camped out in the middle of Syria and Iraq and has been uh, a, a, a really bad influence across the whole region, totalitarian with a very, very strict unrealistic uh, interpretation of the Islamic faith and Islamic law, which they adhere to strictly. And so these are idolatrous temples and they need to be destroyed. And that's what we're looking at here. So destruction going on in both of these archaeological sites. Here, there's at least some attempt to save things. They're destroying it in order to save it. Here, they're destroying it because they believe it needs to be destroyed. Case four, we're looking at wall art, art on walls. Uh, on the top we have uh, a depiction of one of the um, sort of um, mural art, uh, street art by the artist known as Banksy, whose real identity we don't know. And at the bottom we have Chauvet Cave, a, a Paleolithic cave art site in southern France about 35,000 years old. And both of them are depicting animals, both of them are painted onto walls. Banksy was considered, uh, well, I guess still sort of controversial, but especially initially because he did his art on walls without permission. And so it was considered by some to be vandalism. Uh, I don't think anybody would consider the Paleolithic cave art in places like Chauvet to be vandalism. They would consider them to be beautiful, preserved works of art that help us connect over many thousands of years with our human ancestors. Many thousands of years from now, could Banksy's art be viewed the same? Well, believe it or not, across his career from his early days as a sort of outside um, artist against the law, uh, now his art, as soon as it goes up, is cut off the wall and sold at auction for millions of dollars, right? So his value of his art has gone up even in his own lifetime and probably will go up even more over the years from now. So it's kind of interesting to think that Banksy's art could be just as valuable, just as interesting to future archaeologists and future people as we believe Chauvet Cave art is uh, now. Okay, case number five. Here we have two displays showing what archaeologists would call projectile points, what a layperson might call an arrowhead. Um, projectile points are, uh, are lithic artifacts, artifacts made of chipped stone that are attached to spears or arrowheads that are going to be projected forward uh, for some purpose, hunting or warfare. Here on the left we have a display from a museum and you can see there's an informative blurb telling us what lithics or stonework is and then what projectile points are and what the forms mean. Why are these ones small? Why are these ones large? Over here we have a display where it looks really beautiful. The colors are sort of laid out in a pleasing manner. There's geometric shapes and swoops and swirls. And there's no scientific information at all. We're just supposed to look at these things as art objects. And this actually comes from a private arrowhead collector who's gone out and collected arrowheads someplace on the landscape, hopefully on private land where it's technically legal, but perhaps on public land where it's actually illegal to collect any archaeological remains, uh, and yet it's done. And this person does it as a hobby, and they like the aesthetically pleasing shape of these artifacts, and they try to make a display that they can appreciate as art. Is this less valuable than this? Well, I'll tell you one thing, the scientific value is completely missing because we have no idea where these artifacts were found and they haven't been analyzed and they're not displayed in a way that gives any context other than to look at them as beautiful objects of art. Case six, we have uh, um, collections of human remains. At the top, we have an image from the Hallstatt Ossuary in, in Austria 
This is one of several different kinds of uh, these kinds of collections of human remains in Europe, but in other parts of the world, similar kinds of ossuaries exist. Um, in Europe, particularly when the graveyards got full, they removed the bones that were there and to make way for new people, and they would take the bones down to these crypts and arrange them in various ways. This particular one, you can see the, the rest of the skeletons, the long bones are kind of just stacked below, and the skulls are arranged on top of the shelf. But you'll notice that names, sometimes dates, and images are painted onto the skulls, so there's some semblance of you know, reverence and remembrance in this collection. There are other ossuaries in Europe where the bones are arranged in geometric shapes and they make chandeliers out of them. And again, these are usually done in religious contexts by monks um, as a sort of devotional act. Here on the bottom, we have an image of the bioarchaeology lab at Michigan State University. And all the boxes labeled here have human remains in them. And you can see that they've pulled two boxes. They, this bioarchaeologist has laid out the skeletons anatomically on the analysis tables, and they're studying them scientifically. This is a well-organized collection of scientific specimens, and this is an organized collection of devotional or remembrances of you know people's connection to their ancestors. Which one is more ethical? Which one is more scientific? It's hard to know. This one feels more scientific, but this could be scientific if it was analyzed. This feels a little more ethical because these are the descendants dealing with their own ancestors, whereas we don't know uh, if the descendant communities from these people who are in these boxes want their ancestors to be analyzed in the bioarchaeology lab at Michigan State University. Case seven, archeologists at work. At the top, we have Indiana Jones. Uh, this is about as scientific as he gets. He's there uh, judging how much the golden idol weighs and figuring out how much sand he needs to let out of his sandbag so that he won't trip the mechanism. And of course, he botches that. He doesn't analyze that correctly and the arrows shoot at him and the ball rolls down after him. Down here, we have me doing a geoarchaeological analysis in Kazakhstan. This is the Tian Shan Mountain here. This is a site, uh, actually a Bronze Age site, we dated with radiocarbon dating and optically stimulated luminescence to about 3,500 years old. This is my colleague, Claudia Chang. And we are studying the sediments and getting samples for dating and uh, documenting our work here. So I technically, I have sand in my hand. Technically, Indiana Jones has sand in his hand but that's about as uh, similar as we get. Yes, I did travel places to do my work here, but I did not find any gold I idols and I did not definitely did not take them, essentially loot them from their context and, and run away. So I think you can kind of figure out, um, you know, the deal between these two images. Case eight, here we have two images of pipeline projects, oil and gas pipeline projects in the United States. At the top, we have the Houston Lateral Pipeline excavations. Um, and here we have a tribal archeological monitor who is working with the site uh, supervisor. He's there to make sure that remains aren't damaged and to come up with plans if they're gonna be damaged. Down here, we have the Dakota Access Pipeline where that kind of work was not done. Um, sites were damaged and uh, the backlash from uh, tribal groups, particularly the Standing Rock Sioux, whose land was being uh, just essentially dug through, and their allies was uh, commensurate or, you know, e essentially justified by the fact that the people who were trying to drive this pipeline through did not consult with them and damaged some of their heritage sites. And so this is an example of when you do things right and you follow the law and you follow the protocols and you have a good interaction. Um, the people who want to get their projects done can get their projects done and the people who don't want their ancestors and their heritage destroyed or damaged or at least they want some mitigation when it's going to be can have uh, some control over that and feel at least some sense of uh, you know being respected. And when you don't do that you get all kinds of problems. We're going to talk about Dakota Access Pipeline later on in class um, so we'll get all the details of why these folks are lined up there in front of this backhoe later on. Case nine, here we have two examples showing uh, vandalism or graffiti over 
heritage materials. Here at the top, we have modern graffiti vandalism over Red Rock Canyon petroglyph site in Colorado. You see a name spray painted on in graffiti style and a date, 2010. And in the background are petroglyphs um, that are in some places completely obscured. At the bottom here is an image I took at a cathedral in Verona, Italy called Santufamia. And this uh, is a fresco that's probably 10th or 11th century. And we have 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 18th, even 19th century graffiti uh, carved into the fresco. So here you see a date, 1390. Here you see uh, 1538 and the name. Um, we have 1865. We have a whole bunch of uh, 1502 over here in the date. And these are people who came to view the, the or as pilgrims to the church. They viewed the frescoes and they wanted to leave their name and, and, and the date that they came here. And we can still see the beautiful fresco has been restored, um, so the colors are, are lively. Um, and then we have all this great historical information of all the people who came and the times that they did. And so here, the graffiti start, starts to become historically meaningful and valuable. And yeah, it's damaging, but I think most historians and archaeologists would say, well, it's a great archive of the way that this site was used over time and the meanings for the people who came here. But why wouldn't we say that about this kind of graffiti at the top? We would say, this is terrible. They've come, they've vandalized the site. But it's exactly the same thing, a name and a date over an earlier piece of art. And so why is it in sometimes in places we say, oh, look at this great rock art site. There's thousands of years worth of rock art and you know one artist came and did art on top of another. Or look at this great uh, graffiti that tells us all the people who came here you know, in the past. Well, 100, 500, 1,000 years from now, would we look back at this graffiti and say, oh, that's really interesting. Somebody in 2010 valued this site enough that they wanted to leave their mark on it too. What was their motivation for putting their name on top of this, right? So it's kind of interesting. This feels bad and wrong to us, and it is, and I'm not encouraging anyone to go to a heritage site and graffiti over it. But this is exactly the same thing, and it somehow doesn't feel as bad and wrong. Why is that? Okay, finally, here we have two kinds of archaeological artifacts. At the top, we have a 13th century gold mask from Peru, basically Incan. Uh, and here we have flint debitage from the Mesolithic period in England, probably about 10,000-ish years old. Now, I think everyone would agree that this gold mask is the more beautiful of the two aesthetically. But in terms of scientific value, this has probably been looted or was removed from its context. We might be able to do some chemical analysis on it. We could do some stylistic analysis, but that's it. This flint debitage was collected carefully by an archaeologist in an excavation. The sediment was sieved through screens. The, the individual stone tools were picked out and they were cleaned off, brought back to the lab, and now they're gonna be measured carefully and analyzed, and the data that are gonna come out of this can all be tied back to the context from where exactly these pieces of stone were found. And so the scientific value, believe it or not, of this handful of stone tools is probably a lot higher than this beautiful, gorgeous uh, gold mask from 13th century Peru. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, hopefully that explanation will help you kind of put into context your original valuations from the ethicalness and the scientific value of these image pairs. And I want you to use this information to help you reflect on your biases coming into these images and uh, the biases that might come from other people viewing them, uh, you know, when you're doing your write-up. All right.